Good morning. How are we this morning? Hello. We're so happy you're all here today. It's great to see you. This program has been around since 1981. And for the last 30 years, we've been collecting data. It's a community-sponsored program, by the way, with UCSB. And we've been collecting data where the largest historic depository of economic, business, and demographic data in the Central Coast. And each year during this event, there's nearly 100 economic indicators that we analyze, produce, and generate projections for retail sales, population, employment, tourism, to name a few. This effort wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, so we want to thank all of our business, advisory, and corporate level sponsors who contribute to the success of the program. And we want to take special, uh, a special pause here to give acknowledgement to our top four exclusive sponsors. Our founding sponsor, Union Bank. Thank you, Union Bank. Platinum level sponsor, Montecito Bank and Trust. and our gold sponsor and keynote sponsor, Chase Bank and Bank of America. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Couple of program notes for the morning. We will not be taking an intermission. We've consolidated the program. So if you do need to leave your seat, if you could do it between speakers, that would be great. And we also have a survey in your program booklet it really helps us to fine tune this event each year and we would very much appreciate it if you would take a few moments to fill that out. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome to the stage Executive Vice Chancellor Jean Lucas. Good morning, everybody. First thing I want to do is to thank you for coming this morning. Uh, it's really good to see such a full house and it's become an important uh, spring ritual for us to see what flowers are going to bloom in the economy. Um, the second thing I want to do is thank Peter Rupert, uh, the director for the Economic Forecast Project. Peter's just done a terrific job of transforming EFP into a very useful instrument for all of you uh, to understand what's going on in our local economy and in the context of the national and, and, uh, and global economy. Uh, the third thing I want to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is just uh, uh, tell you a little bit about what's going on at UCSB that's important to the, uh, the, the community. Uh, the first thing um, is that after about a decade, we finally have approval for a brand new technology management program as an academic unit and a master's degree of technology management. And the uh, first cohort of students will start in fall of 2014. The second thing uh, to let you know is that we've developed a partnership uh, between UCSB, the city of Goleta, and the Goleta Valley Chamber of Commerce called GEM, G-E-M, which is Goleta Entrepreneurial Magnet. And it's a, it's a partnership to try to get ideas uh, and, uh, and new knowledge that are developed at UCSB out into the business place as startup companies in the, in the greater Goleta Valley. And we've just hired Doug Lynch as the executive director uh, for that uh, project. And under Doug's uh, leadership, I'm sure it will, it will grow. So stay tuned to, to see what happens with Jim. And the final thing is just to do one little brag about UCSB. There's a, a, there's a bunch of rankings that come out uh, year after year. And a new one that's come on the scene last year is called the Leiden Ranking, comes out of Leiden University in the Netherlands. And it, uh, it rates the top 500 universities in the, in the world on impact in science and social science. And it's based on uh, numbers of publications per faculty member, uh, the number of times those publications are cited in the literature, and the journals that they appear in with respect to their importance. And last year, UCSB came in seventh in the world, number seven. The top six were private universities, so we're the top public research university in the, in the world in this area. This year, we came out number two in the world. Thank you. We're, we're very proud of that. Number one is a small technical college in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We've got them in our sights, and they're a little bit worried at this point in time, which is a good thing. So uh, it, it's important for us, and I think it's important for you, um, because UCSB plays such a big role in our, in our community as a whole. So with that, I want to thank you, and we look forward to a very good program this morning. Thanks.
Okay, so where were we last year at this time? Some of us were in this room uh, um, seeing what was going on, and this blue line over here was one year ago today. This is the S&P 500. So since a year ago, um, there's been a 14% increase in uh, the S&P 500. By the way, since I took over for the forecast project, it's gone up 55%. <clears throat> See, a lot of economists would, or politicians would say, you know, they should take the credit because there's correlation there. And I won't take too much of the credit for that. Um, so the other thing is that the economy has been improving, that's for sure. What we see is we see lower unemployment rates. As you can see, um, for the U.S., unemployment's fallen. California as a whole is higher than the U.S., as it has been for a while. And Santa Barbara is lower than um, that in the U.S. And we've seen our unemployment rate here in Santa Barbara falling. One thing I want to remind you of, and I told you this last year. You didn't listen to me. I did this thing about Google Insight and Google Trends and how you could use Google Insight to think about the economy um, in, a, in a very um, uh, high-frequency way. Da daily, for example, hourly. Well, that was a year ago. This came out from CNN just a few days ago, April 26th. Two people um, in scientific report, they found that between 2004 to 2011, when search volumes rose for terms such as debt, money, and unemployment, so they just Googled, they went to Google Insights, searched for the word debt or unemployment, and every time they saw that, they sold the market short for a week. And every time there was a decline in those words, they bought long for a week. What does it say here? They did that, it was a 320% profit they made. So this is gonna be my last forecast project. Uh, I'll be in, uh, <laughs> we'll do it in Aruba next year. <clears throat> um, the other thing we had last year, we had three Fed presidents. And some of you may have remembered that they said, you know, we're, you know we, we're, we're kind of on top of things now. We've, we've basically figured out what we're gonna do. We have a plan. Well, that was here when there were this many excess reserves. And since last year, there's been a huge increase, again, in excess reserves of the banking system. Secondly, we can see here, this is the program where they're buying uh, long-term securities. So this is just increasing the balance sheet even more. So it's very interesting that back then, a year ago, they said, we're gonna start unwinding. We know what we're doing. Well, if you've just seen in the last couple days, we saw the ECB has lowered the, uh, their interest rate, and the Fed has al also said that they're going to keep the interest rate low, um, sli slightly more uh, symmetric um, uh, risks. So what's the brief overview I want to talk about? So the U.S., we've seen a very slow, steady recovery, and we've seen a graph, and I'll show you another graph. Santa Barbara, very, very little change in our output measures, and I'll go through those in a second. In the U.S. economy, people are spending. You can start to see them spending, but it's not clear why. Incomes really aren't rising very much. They've deleveraged, as I'll show you. So where the spending is coming from is a little bit unclear. The labor market remains a big issue, by the way. I'll show you some slides on that. And locally, there's been a lot of activity in housing markets. So if you look at this book that you got, um, it's, it's got this spider-looking thing on the front cover. So that spider-looking thing People call it a spider chart. Many people call it a radar chart. That was what it was programmed to do. So this is kind of what you see. This is not the exact one that's in your book. You can read about that exact one. And let me explain what it does. It's my movie. So what this is, it's showing you year by year various components of the Santa Barbara economy and how it moved over the recession. So what's the idea of this chart? I'm going to do it again, so, so now I'll tell you what it is. The inner ring is um, the minimum, the worst of any of these statistics between 1999 and 2012. So for example, if you were in here, this would be when, if you're on this yellow ring on the inside, 
That would be when unemployment, for example, was the highest. That would be where foreclosures were the highest. Going to the outer red ring is better. So every time you see it getting out toward the red ring, that means the economy's improved, and every time it shrinks in, the economy's gotten worse. So that's the idea of this, of this graph. So you can see now, so this was 1999. What did we have? Um, very low foreclosures. Remember, out means better, not more. Out means better. So this means that um, 1999, it was the lowest we have seen uh, foreclosures um, during this time period between 1999 and 2012. Unemployment rate was the lowest. South County housing sales, et cetera. So now as we move along, you can start to see this thing move. When it gets gray inside, that was an official recession that came from the National Bureau of Economic Research. So there's 1999, you can see the date up in the top. 2000, 2001 was a recession according to the um, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. And you can see in Santa Barbara, by the way, you know, um, not much was really happening um, to the growth rate of GDP, unemployment was still pretty low, very low foreclosures, etc. As we move to 2002, 2003, so now we're almost, everything's almost at the outer red ring. That means that the economy was really doing well, it was hitting on all cylinders during that time. Again, right out by the ring, 2005. 2006, you can see it start to shrink in. In Santa Barbara County, the recession started before the NBER says that the U.S. started. What you can see is 2006, 2007, now we contracted even more. So you can see um, everything now is starting to move away from the red. There's 2007, there's 2008. So that's, now you can see sort of what's happened. What happened here, <clears throat> foreclosures, North County rose to the highest level of all time between 1999 and 2012. South County foreclosures, the same thing. Housing sales just dropped like a rock. Um, employment sort of stayed high here, but you can see that the growth rate of GDP fell to its lowest rate. Real household income fell to its lowest rate, as did retail sales. Right, so this is what a recession looks like. There's 2009, now the um, the National Bureau of Economic Research said that, you know, we're in this recession, it's worse, and you can see now a whole bunch of things are really close. There's 2010, so we're in a recovery now. Doesn't look too much like a recovery yet. 2011, 2012. So the idea of this graph then shows you where we have, where we're still hurting, where we have to get better. So where is that? Well, foreclosures, um, in the North County, came back, um, dropped a lot. In terms of the South County, there's still more foreclosures than you know, we'd seen. Sales of houses are still down over the year, 2012. Recently, we've seen some, some increase. Um, retail permits, these are new stores, permits for stores. Um, it's at its lowest level since between 1999 and 2012. Okay, so now I wanna go through just for fun, I'll play it fast again for you. Oops. Not all of them fast, I meant. Oh yeah, that's when I took over. Um, <clears throat> so that's how an economy moves over a cycle, and you can see it in all these different dimensions. So in one chart, you're able to see exactly where we are today versus the lowest we've ever been. Okay, and so you can look at all these dimensions, and it's a very simple thing to do in just one chart. Tom put up a chart that looks similar to this. This is real GDP growth. This is an output measure, so what I'm gonna do now is talk about those output measures from that spider chart. These are the output measures. I'm gonna talk about some growth rates of GDP, retail sales, income, et cetera. So this is GDP. As Tom pointed out, GDP, so this is over different recessions where every um, recession, I normalized at zero and then follow the economy along. This is the last recession and recovery that we're in now, and you can see that these are quarters, five years out. It, it took about four years before we got back to the same level of GDP as we were back in December of 2007, which was the beginning of the recession. 
you can see that it's been much, much slower than the other recoveries. And that's what people, has people concerned still. This is a very, very slow growth we're seeing. But it is growth, and you look at Europe, almost every country in Europe now is back in, falling back into recession. This is another way to look at GDP growth, and you can see the recessions. You can see that the 2000, 2001, um, uh, 2002 recession was pretty small, relatively speaking. This is the current recession that we were just in and the recovery. What I want you to see here is that, you know, month quarter to quarter movements are fairly large. And so what I've done is I said, look, let's look at the year over year change. That's the blue line. So the blue line shows you that since we recovered, it's been pretty flat. You can go back historically before 2000 and you can see that the average growth rate was up here between 2000 2008 it was up here and now we're kind of flattened out again at a little bit lower rate so the question is are we going to come back and grow at the same rates as we were back in the 1990s and and Doug pointed out we had 25 uh, very good years so this is an um, also gross domestic product but now it's for the United States California and Santa Barbara County so what you can see from this picture is that Santa Barbara is doing really, really well coming out um, before this recession, 2004, 2005. You could see that in the spider chart I showed you where retail sales were out, unemployment was low, et cetera. It turns out, though, that where we saw the recession in California and the U.S. economy, it was very, very minor in some sense compared to those areas for Santa Barbara. We didn't feel the, bi the big up growth, but we also didn't feel the big decline that happened in California. One thing to note, by the way, is since 2005, real gross domestic product, that is our output in, the US, in Santa Barbara County, has been basically um, flat. We're not growing um, much at all. So that's been pretty flat. I talked about permits and sales. This is a very nice way to sort of think about what's happening. So this picture is the types of um, stores. This is going to be the growth in taxable sales versus permits. So what are we going to show here? For example, let's look at sporting goods stores. Sporting goods store sales, which is the dark bar, um, uh, grew. However, the permits for stores grew by more. What that means is that sales per store fell, <clears throat> right? Sales went up a little bit, stores went up a lot. So you can look at where the big growth was. The big growth was in sales and, ga and gas and furniture and home furnishings last year. That was the largest two uh, growers. And you can see that general merchandise stores, there was a lot of permits there and a lot of permits for food and beverage. Clothing and clothing accessories fell um, um, <clears throat> in terms of numbers of permits, uh, et cetera. So now what I can do is I can just take those numbers and I can look at sales per permit. So sales per permit is now this blue hatched line. And as I was saying before, that sales per permit, this is like sales per store, right? So you can see for sporting goods stores, sales per store have been falling. They fell over the last year. Even though sales were up, st there were more stores. In terms of general merchandise stores, you can see sales per store fell a lot. Food and beverage stores also fell a lot. So this is one way to sort of get a sense of that where we're growing and thinking about store sales per store. I mentioned already this is personal income. Personal income has been fairly flat, even declining a little bit in Santa Barbara County. This is nominal dollars. The dark blue line is in real where we've adjusted for inflation. So again, the point here is that it's not been growing very fast, but it happened to grow slowly even a little bit before the recession started. This is median household income by region. Many times you look at median household income, you just look at for Santa Barbara County, it masks very, very large differences, as we all know, about our county. So if you look, for example, in Guadalupe, Lompoc, um, uh, Santa Maria, median household income is much lower than it is in Goleta, Bu Buellton, Solvang, this is Santa Barbara City. This is the median for the entire county. So you can see that you know, in order to sort of understand the data that we, that we look at and you, want to, and, you want to, and you want to look at, you certainly want to look at these, um, uh, th these by area, not necessarily just for the county as a whole. 
This is a distribution of income. And so why do we care about this? Many people talk about sort of the hollowing out of the middle sector. So what this shows you is it's kind of true, it looks like. So this graph shows between 2006 and 2013, so the blue is 2006. What this says here is that about 11% of the population in 2006 made less than 15,000 in Santa Barbara County. By 2013, there were fewer people making that low. These also fell. There were fewer people going from 10% to about 8% of the people making between 25 and 35,000. All of them fell. The one that rose the most was people making between 100 and 500,000. So what that says is there's fewer people in this range, more people in this range. Okay, so that's kind of a, a way to sort of think about, um, in some sense, the hollowing out of sort of the middle class that people like to talk about. Now I want to talk a little bit about the labor market. That's um, uh, uh, unemployment, employment, et cetera. So the big issue, as always, is about jobs. That's always on the, on the, on the, on the front burner. This is why it's been such a big issue. This is for the U.S. as a whole, by the way. This is the employment to population ratio, which I like to look at a little bit more than the unemployment rate. This tells us how many people are working that could be working out of the population. You can see that since the recession, it fell. It started out about the same for the first year as other recessions, but it fell a lot more, and it has not budged, right? It hasn't budged in almost three years, the employment to population rate. That says that, and by the way, it may never get back. There's no reason it should go back necessarily. There's lots of reasons why people choose to work or not to work. I'm not saying it needs to go back up here, but this is one of the things that people look at. This is a picture of that same chart, but for Santa Barbara County as well. And you can see that for the U.S. as a whole, as I showed you, it was not changed. Not true for Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara fell just like in the, uh, the U.S. did. However, it's picked up over the last couple of years. So the, um, the, labor, uh, the employment to population ratio has actually been rising here in Santa Barbara County, which um, means people are getting back to work. In terms of really local labor markets, some areas are doing well, some are doing poorly. So this is a picture of, um, for Santa Barbara County, and what I've done here is the width of these bars is the size of the sector in terms of employment. So it turns out in Santa Barbara County, the largest sector is government. Because there's no height of a bar there, that means government employment growth has been zero. Right? Between 2009 and 2012, government employment has been flat, no, no change. The largest growing are the two smallest sectors, it turns out, in terms of percentage growth. That is mining and information technologies. Mining's growing a lot more than that, but it went off the chart, so I just cut it off. Mining employment's grown a lot. The, other big, the second biggest sector, trades, transportation, and utilities, you can see has shrank. Professional and business services has risen by about 10%. Leisure and hospitality, education, health services, agriculture. What's fallen? Stuff that we've, you know about. Construction, financial activities, services, some other services. So those are the areas that are, are in decline between 2009 and 2012. These other sectors in terms of employment have actually grown. This is a picture of unemployment rates, and I showed you sort of unemployment before, but this is a longer time series. And you can see that California is typically above the U.S. Santa Barbara is typically below the U.S. Back here, Santa Barbara was above. There may be some interesting things here about why it's changed a little bit, why it is that here Santa Barbara was above in terms of unemployment, and now it's below, um, and now it's sort of the same. Looking closer into different types of jobs, for example, construction might be a key to sort of why that happens the way it does. This is a picture for California as a whole. Same kind of picture I put before. You can see, again, the largest sector government. It actually shrank in California, government employment. The largest increase, again, mining in California. 
and construction financial activities. Here, however, information technologies has fallen. So you can see that overall, um, you know, these areas are the ones that uh, um, have sort of the largest uh, employment in them because this is a very tiny, thin bar that means not many people work in mining. But percentage-wise, the growth was very high. Now, when we look at occupations, um, for example, we can see the um, Employment Development Department predicts what jobs are going to be around, uh, are going to grow over the next 10 years. So they did this back in 2008. This is employment projections by occupation. They say that um, it's going to, you know, farm workers is the largest growing. That's pretty good. Agriculture is growing. Um, so waiters, retail salespersons, these are all the high job growth areas as predicted by the Employment um, uh, Development Department. These red dots are the average salary of those. The point here again is that most of the job creation that they're predicting over the next six years are in very low paying occupations like $20,000. They're retail salespeople. We hear all the time, what we want to do is we want to create high paying jobs. Remember, most jobs that get created are actually not high paying jobs. There are many more waiters than CEOs. Right? So most job creation is here. If we can do this, if everybody can be a general manager, great. So lesson, become general manager. <laughs> Tell your kids that's what they should do. So what actually did happen? I showed you some of the projections. What actually did happen in terms of the different areas of job growth? Well, it turns out that um, between 2009 and 2012, the largest number was 3,500 jobs created in the professional and business services. As I told you before, construction has fallen, trade and transportation has fallen, etc. You can see mining in terms of total employment is just very small. How about wages in this over 2009 to 2012 for the high growing and low growing occupations? Well, you can see that mining pays a lot. So you should be a general manager in mining, I guess. Um, professional and business services, you know, not too bad. Um, and, you know, some of the areas that have fallen, you know, are fairly high paying. So this gives you a sense of the types of jobs that are being created and being destroyed and the wages that go along with those jobs. Now I want to talk a little bit about the housing sector. I have another movie. So what's this? Before I play the movie, I'll tell you at this time. So this pie chart shows you the sales of houses um, by price. The dark, the very darkest, is two million plus. And then it goes to one to two million, 750,000 to one million, 500,000 to 750,000 is this color. This is um, 250 to 500 and under. Okay, so I'm now gonna play you this animation and you're gonna see how this pie chart changes. Remember, here, the darker it is means the higher the price of the sales. Okay, I'll do it slower. So this is, um, this is 2000. What does this show? It shows that, um, you know, 12% of houses sold for more than 2 million. 38% of houses, the largest chunk here, was between 500 and 750, right? That's the largest chunk. That was in year 2000. So now let's get closer to the recession. You can see in 2001, we were still growing. Those were good times. This blue sector is shrinking. This is growing. What this says is, you know, 24, 46, 58% um, of houses, you know, were more than 750,000. Now you can see 16% of all sales were more than 2 million. And now we have, you know, more than 75% of all sales were um, above 750,000 going into 2003, right? Now we have, 51% of all houses sold were between 1 and 2 million back in 2004. 
58% in 2005. As I told you, the recession hit, Calif hit Santa Barbara County a little bit earlier than what the National Bureau of Economic Res Research says that the re when the recession occurred. We started to see this change back in 2006 and 2007, and now you can see the effects of house sales. And now you can see we were kind of back where we were. 32% of house sales are between 500 and 750. 13% are above 2 million, just kind of like it was um, before. So that gives you a sense of what, they, what houses were selling like and how to watch that unfold as the years go by. This is the Case-Shiller um, Home Price Index. You can see the recession in the US. These are for 20 cities and 10 cities. You can see it started to come back, a little bit of a dip again, and now house prices are back here. Um, you can see that they're nowhere near the top. Not clear that they ever will get back there um, um, very soon. This is something else we should pay attention to. This is South Coast sales uh, prices versus Northern, for North, uh, North County. And you can see here that for Santa Barbara as a whole, the whole county, there's a little bit of a tick up. However, look at North Santa Barbara, nothing, and South Santa Barbara. It's because of the mix of these things, right? Because South County houses sell for more. If more of them sell, um, uh, we can get the median for Santa Barbara County to be rising, even though these things are flat, depending on the mix. But you can see that since the house de price decline, we've been pretty flat until just recently. This is house prices by um, city. Everything here is well known to all of us. Um, Guadalupe, Lompoc, Santa Maria, much, much different than Santa Barbara, Goleta, and Solvang, Santa Barbara being the highest by far. You can see the run up in prices, the run down, and then as I told you, you know, for the last couple of years it's been pretty flat, even though you see some spikes up and down uh, over time. This is from Zillow. So Zillow, we can get till, you know, just a few weeks ago. We can see house prices in Zillow, and this is what I was telling you, that um, in these different areas in Santa Barbara, um, Eucalyptus Hill, Riviera, Silito, et cetera, you can see house prices have ticked up over the last month or so, a couple of months. So we're starting to see sales price uh, rising, even though here we had still fallen and it was a little bit flat. That's for some other areas, east side versus west side. But again, everything here looks like house prices are starting to rise again, um, and we have this data that's very recent. This is something I showed you in the, in the chart. You could see it, foreclosures. This is for Santa Barbara. You can see that foreclosures, you know, we never really had a lot of them, but certainly um, it's come down. And these are sales. You can see the sales pick up um, and a little bit um, jagged. That's because there just aren't a lot, you know. So if one month something sells a lot, you know, these things spikes all over. So what you want to look at here really is to think about the trends. It was pretty flat. We saw maybe a slight rise. Who knows if it's going to uh, maintain that rise. So now I can't do this for Santa Barbara. We don't have the data. But I want to show you a little bit about financial health. I want to talk a little bit about households and a little bit about businesses. So first we'll start with households. This is total assets as a percent of GDP for the US economy, owned by households. This is what you can see about the wealth decline, the assets that we held. Um, typically, it doesn't fall very much and rises. This is the last recession. The last recession um, fell precipitously, and then you can see we're not really coming back in terms of assets as a percent of GDP as, as households. Well, where, where would we find that? How about real estate assets as a percent of GDP? And this is no shock to anybody, but now you can really see it. This is real estate assets as a percent of total GDP, of your income. And you can see it fell, it kept falling for four years, and now it's started to pick up a little bit, as we've seen. So housing wealth is pretty low, still. This is uh, household sector total borrowing as a percent of GDP. And just what you thought should happen, because what we've seen, borrowing fell a lot. 
it stayed low for a long period of time, and we've seen this. We know that banks are trying to lend. They have lots of cash. They're willing to lend. There's no borrowing really going on. As a fraction of GDP, you can see it started to rise a little bit. Other recessions and recoveries, you know, it never fell by this much. What has risen here? Well, checkable deposits and currency. Households are sitting on their stuff, right? They've got the currency under their mattress. That's what this is, a huge rise in just currency and checkable deposits, not, being, not borrowed. What does that imply? It implies that debt outstanding to GDP is very, very low and not changing. This is the household deleveraging that we've been looking at. Like I said, I don't have the data for Santa Barbara County, but you can really see the deleveraging that's occurred across households. This is household sector net worth as a percent of GDP, and again, it's, you know, it's not growing fast. So this is kind of the wealth hit, the net worth of households fell, and it's yet to pick up um, uh, even close to where it started at, in December of 2007. Where are some areas of worry? Well, this is um, delinquency status of individuals in the U.S. And what you can see here is this, this dark orange is se severely derogatory payments, or behind on their payments. Yellow is 90 days late, etc. You can see the recession approaching. You can see 2007, December was the recession. And you can see that there's still lots and lots of loans that are delinquent. It's starting to come back a little bit, but still, um, trouble areas here. How about types of loans? Well, it looks like mortgage loans, delinquent mortgage loans has been falling. We kind of know that. The only thing rising here are student loans. Damn students. Yeah, they're becoming delinquent. Um, this is a HELOC, this is you know, housing equity, and you can see that um, uh, it's also declined. And you can see the rise during the recession in mortgages and home equity lines of credit. Auto loans also rose, and they've been starting to fall. Turning to business, this is corporate total assets as a percent of GDP, and you can see it's not back yet either. This is business corporate borrowing as a percent of GDP. It felt like crazy more than it's ever fallen before in, in different recessions, but now it's climbed back to where it was in December 2007. So businesses are borrowing again, starting up, etc. All good signs. Businesses are also hoarding cash. This is business checkable deposits and currency as a percent of GDP. Again, it's the highest we've kind of seen. Corporate debt outstanding, this was some corporate deleveraging, and now it's risen back up again, so corporate, corporate borrowing is, is, is going on. So, what's a little summary of the financial health? Well, businesses still down, corporate assets. They're starting to borrow again, that's good. Households, huge deleveraging, still holding on to lots of cash. Net worth is still very low for households. So this is an economic forecast project. I say it all the time, I don't forecast. Just, I don't know, just don't do it. Um, <laughs> but other people do. And um, the Fed does, for example. And when I think about monetary policy, it's good to listen to what the Fed says, turns out. That's what they do. So this is the federal funds rate and projection of what the federal funds rate is going to do. I just love this graph. This is the federal funds rate back in uh, 2004. You can see it was climbing, climbing, climbing up to about five and a quarter, five and a half percent. And then we started, we got into the recession. They cut, they cut, they cut, they cut. And it's just been flat, right, since 2008. And it's projected to be flat for another year, basically, at least. The Fed's making some comments now that they're ready to do maybe QE4 or whatever the number they're at now. Where do we see that? Well, again, the Fed makes forecasts. So there's something called the, um, uh, the range and the central tendency. 
This comes from the Federal Reserve Banks. This is their best guess as to what's going to happen in the economy. So what's the best guess? Well, the best guess is kind of within these bands. So the central tendency means you throw out a couple of the high ones and throw out a couple of the low ones, and then just look at that central tendency. So we're about here now. So year over year, we grew about 1.8% over this last year. There, almost everyone's projecting now that we're going to be growing somewhere like 25 to 3% in 2013, and then higher growth even in 2014. So that's kind of the best projection. You know, um, it comes from just the data, obviously. They work really hard to do this stuff, um, so I pay attention to it. This, you can actually see government policy in action. So when we talk about QE2 and QE3, et cetera, you can see it in the data. It's very clear what they did. What they did was, these are total reserves, ex and ex excess reserves, and these are required reserves. Right? So these are excess reserves. And you can see QE3 and QE2, QE3 and QE2 very clearly in the data when we got the, all the reserves entering the banking system. So, summary. Indeed, the Great Recession has been great. There's no doubt about it. We're still not recovered. Remember, the Great Recession started in December of 2007. We're now in 2013. So it's been a long time. Things are still growing. We might still see some evidence of some deleveraging out there. Housing prices are starting to rise. Sales are starting to rise. Those are all good signs locally. However, as I mentioned, local income has been stagnant for about five years. We're not seeing any rise in local income. What are the growth prospects? Well, I was told never to show this graph again, but it's my talk. So, um, so I always show this graph because I like it. This starts in 1929. It's real gross domestic product. It's real income. They're the same thing. This grows. This is a logarithm of that. The reason I do logarithms is so you can see a straight line. That straight line, you know, means that we get richer every year on average by somewhere between 2 and 3%. Every year we get richer. You can see one huge thing here. This is the De Great Depression. This is World War II. Aside from those things, you can see this is not too bad. It's pretty straight. What's happened during those times? We've had other wars. We've had good and bad presidents. We've had hurricanes. We've had all kinds of things. We've had, you know, trying to stop this from happening. The market is amazing. So what do I predict? I predict there's nothing that's going to stop us from growing at this rate. We get these little wiggles from time to time. This is the great recession we're in now. That. You know, in the whole scope, it's not so big. When we're living it, it's really bad, and we think we should do lots of things. But no matter what we do, you can see, Democrats, Republicans, whatever, this grows like that. So I'm optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you for, for having me here today. This is incredibly cool, if you could see this uh, speaking in a, in a theater. Usually I'm in a, a soulless hotel ballroom, uh, so this is, this is really special. And, and it really is a pleasure to be here today, to be along with Professor Cooley, sort of part of a mini NYU invasion of Southern California, uh, and to speak at this great conference. And the conference, um, it's up there, but it has, uh, at least out on the, um, on, on the on the billboard outside is, is a, of course, a conference about looking forward. Forecast is in the name. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about today in, in, my, in, in our conversation about more recent history um, and the lessons that I believe we should have drawn but did not draw from the most recent financial crisis and why I think, as a result of not learning those lessons, we may very well be on a path toward an, towards an even more disastrous crisis than the one that we just experienced. Now, it's kind of hard to believe it was just four and a half years ago that we were really in the throes of the great financial crisis. But for huge parts of 
Washington and Wall Street, it might as well be ancient history. We see that recently in the news with the J.P. Morgan whale incident, that how little has changed in the culture of, of, of Wall Street. There we saw big bets being made, uh, high risk, um, with short -term, looking for short-term gains. Uh, in a manner, when it started to go bad, the reaction wasn't to change the trade, it was to change the risk model. It was, there was a cover-up, uh, and it seems now with some of the disclosures that it was all driven by an attempt to drive up executive compensation, uh, and to keep for the regulators from finding out exactly what was going on and keeping the pressure to keep the capital level as low as possible, so relying on more borrowed money. The White House and Treasury Department, well, it seems like you know, they have now bought into the whole bank lobbyist idea that mission has been accomplished, that there's nothing else to worry about, ignoring some very powerful evidence that our preservation of the status quo has left a legacy that continues to be influenced by too big to fail. And Congress, Good old Congress. Congress who has the bank lobbying machine is fully revved up and ready to go. And then not so recently, and I think accurately discredited orthodoxy of deregulation at all cost, is actually once again rearing its head. And I think we're in grave danger of a bipartisan support to weaken the already watered down regulatory provisions within Dodd-Frank, and specifically in one of the most dangerous areas of, of derivatives. It's like 2008 didn't happen again, and no one remembers that we had a financial crisis driven by the perversions of too big to fail along with this deregulatory mania. Now, if my comments today sound a little skeptical, a little strident, you'll have to forgive me. Um, this is my, my professional training. Uh, as, as you heard in the introduction, I spent a good portion of my career dealing with some of the most unethical, uh, sociopathic, criminal minds imaginable. And that was just my two years at Treasury and, and dealing with Treasury and the Congress. Uh, before that, I was a federal prosecutor. And you know, I, I investigated cases really from, from the, the jungles of Columbia to the boardrooms of, of Wall Street. And it made me, I've been described as sort of a squinty-eyed prosecutor's view of the world. And of course, that's training is how I ended up getting the job in Washington. Um, but interestingly, part of what that experience is what got me on this strange path before you today. Because when I graduated law school, um, I was a student at NYU, uh, where I really got the bug for public service. And I wanted to, my only job I wanted to have was to be an assistant United States attorney, a federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York in Lower Manhattan. Um, and after well, in a couple law firms uh, where I did white collar defense work, in 2000 I got the job. And I fell in love with investigating large transnational, international narcotics organizations. Uh, I found it fascinating work. And in 2004, my biggest case was into a group in Colombia called the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. And they weren't a normal drug trafficking organization. Uh, they were an army. They were 20,000 members strong. They patrolled large chunks of the Colombian countryside. Um, and as we exposed them in our subsequent indictment, where we, we charged the top 50 leaders of the organization, uh, they were the world's biggest supplier, more than half of the world's supply of cocaine. And we're putting that, that case together, and it's a big case, but you do it in sort of the same ways. And one of the things we're relying on are cooperators, former members of the FARC who had defected from the, the, the organization and part of a Colombian government program received amnesty if they confessed their sins and would be reinserted into society. And we probably spent, interviewed about 100 of these former narco-terrorists uh, in different port places around Colombia in 2004. And in late in 04, I was interviewing this one witness, and I told her, that she had made the cut. She was going to be one of the very small handful of witnesses that we were going to take out of Columbia, uh, bring to New York, put in the witness protection program, and help form the core of our, our, our case against the, the FARC leadership. And I told her, and she reacted, and she seemed pretty OK with it. She seemed happy. Uh, but she said something. She said, Mr. Neal, there's something I need to tell you. Oh, go ahead. Um, well, I kind of like to wait until we get to New York first. OK, fine. You know, she was pregnant at the time. And, uh, this was a large room with Colombian agents and DEA agents, and I know by this point uh, how brutal the FARC was towards its women members. So I thought, oh, okay, maybe it's something she's not really comfortable talking about in this giant room full of men, and that we'll talk later. I kind of forgot about it until she came a couple months later, and we were in the United States, and she said, oh, remember that thing I wanted to tell you? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, what, what's that all about? And she explained to me that the FARC had infiltrated our investigation that they had sent a double agent in who, after meeting with us, would go back into the jungle and, and meet with their, uh, their superiors. 
she explained that she was that double agent and that after our penultimate meeting in Columbia, she had gone and gave a description of me and they had a sketch artist and they did my picture and some of the different agents. And on that day of our last meeting, she didn't come to Bogota alone, she came with a small militia group and that her job was during a break to call in the location of our meeting uh, and they would come and they would grab me to try to kidnap me and if that didn't work out, to, to, to murder me. Um, and as she was sort of explaining how they were joking about how they were gonna torture me and, and um, how this was really gonna be a really good get for, for the FARC, uh, I asked her why she didn't go through with the plan. And she said basically I offered her a better deal. Um, <laughs> And so that was the end of my international narcotics trafficking career. Uh, and I think I'd still be doing that work if it wasn't for this. But the office realized that I, I and I realized I wasn't going back to Columbia anytime soon. I really couldn't do that work. So it's, that's when I fell back on the white collar stuff I had done as a defense lawyer, joined the securities fraud unit where I ended up uh, investigating, prosecuting, and convicting the leadership of, uh, of, of REFCO, uh, commodities giant that ex imploded under a multi-billion dollar accounting fraud. Um, and it was from the success of that case that I was eventually asked in early 2008 by my boss to start up a mortgage fraud group, uh, investigating the you know, explosion of mortgage fraud that was becoming exposed uh, as the financial crisis started to take hold in early 2008. And I think because of those experiences, uh, because of the work I did on securities fraud, on getting to learn the underbelly of Wall Street and on mortgage fraud, I, when things started to fall apart in 2008, as institutions in New York like Bear Stearns and Lehman disappear, Fannie and Freddie and AIG essentially take it over by the United States government, I was able to watch it with what I describe as a sense of detached horror. Now, the horror was because I had an understanding of what happened. I had seen how in this name of this sort of magical thing that we were told, financial innovation, these incredibly complex mortgage-related products that were going to do these wonderful things. We were told by Wall Street they were going to be the source of unending and certain profits. We were told by the government that it was the key that was going to unlock the dream of American home ownership for, for all Americans. And we were told by the regulators that through some sort of alchemy, these incredibly complex products were actually reducing risk in the system. That we were, we've reached a day where we would never again have financial crises because being able through this innovation and through low interest rates, we have this great moderation uh, that crisis were a thing of the past. All of these things which were accepted as absolute truths until of course they were proven to be horribly and, and horrendously wrong. And I got to see how this, all this innovation was really keyed on one thing, the United States American mortgage and how these products, which of course were thousands of mortgages getting put together into uh, mortgage-backed securities, and how those mortgage-backed securities bonds got turned into and more complex uh, CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and how bonds from them would go into even more complex called CDO squared, and how there would be derivative bets on the performance of these complex CDOs and that called credit default swaps, and how they get pulled together and turn into even more complex instruments called synthetic CDOs and synthetic CDOs squared and bets on that. But it all came back to the United States American mortgage. And I saw how this money-making machine would stall if there weren't enough mortgages to fuel the securitization machine. So what did they do when they sort of ran out of the okay mortgages? the okay subprime mortgages. Do they stop, say, okay guys, we did good, let's pack it up, we made some good profits, let's move on. No, they had to find more mortgages to feed, to feed the machine. So I saw the gutting of underwriting standards. You know, that remarkably quaint idea that financial institutions, banks and non-bank lenders, actually would care whether the borrower could repay the loan. Um, things like, you know, crazy things like verifying income, making sure they actually have a job. I saw how those things got thrown out the window, uh, as well as affordability. I saw how fraud, something that is of course traditionally the thing to be purged out of the mortgage process, became something that was first ignored, then encouraged, participated in, and covered up by the people originating and eventually packaging and selling these loans. Because it didn't matter whether someone could repay or if it was fraud when you weren't holding the loan when you were selling it off and selling it off and it was some hapless investor who got left holding the bag. And I saw how this process made everyone in the middle pretty wealthy, made a lot of money, buy your own island type of money. 
but it wasn't so good for the people at the ends. The borrowers who were victims of predatory practices and signing mortgages they didn't understand and never had any chance of being able to repay. And the investors um, who uh, convinced that they were buying something that was as safe as United States government debt uh, until, of course, it turned out not to be so. And that in between there was all type of, of, of really incredibly unethical and, and indeed illegal behavior. I mean, you had mortgage brokers who were, were lying to borrowers, tricking them into mortgages, changing their information on the application in order to get them the loan. And, and what totally was legal uh, at the time would get paid thousands of dollars just to convince a borrower who totally qualified for an affordable prime mortgage to steer them away and get them into uh, an unaffordable but higher yielding subprime mortgage. Of course, that incentive came from, from the, 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 those who were buying the mortgages and packaging them up and turning them into these securities. Um, and those officials saw how they were blowing through giant waving red flags, due diligence reports that showed that what they were saying were in those bonds had very little relation to the, the garbage that was actually going in. Whistleblowers, who instead of being rewarded and encouraged to come forward, were punished, fired for, for speaking the truth. And how on, the, on, that, on that dark side of the investors, how not only were they being uh, uh, deceived, tricked by, by salesmen who were selling them products that we know towards the end they knew were full of garbage, uh, while at the same time the institutions were actually betting against their clients, betting against the market, and at times betting against the very same products that they were selling, uh, but also by the credit rating agencies, um, who in this sort of mad race to the bottom, in this quest for market share, were slapping AAA ratings on tens of thousands of mortgages uh, that were full of garbage. And as we know from the recent allegations in the Department of Justice lawsuit, uh, things that they knew full well didn't merit these ratings. So I watched all this, as I said, with a sense of detached horror. My detachment was, is it wasn't really impacting me. Um, I was a renter, not a homeowner, so you know, de declining housing prices wasn't hitting my bottom line. And, and frankly, I had a safe job in the United States government. If anything, traditionally, being a fraud prosecutor, financial crises are good for business. Um, so it wasn't really hitting me personally until mid-October of 2008, and that's when it, it, it really changed, when I got called to the office of my boss, Mike Garcia, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. And I remember he called me into his office and he handed me a printout. He was on the phone. I look at the top. It said Special Inspector General. And I'm sort of half reading it, not really understanding. And when Mike got off the phone, he explained to me what it was I was reading. He said that when Congress passed the $700 billion uh, TARP bill that enabled Treasury to go out and spend this amount of money as part of the financial rescue, that they created this brand new office called the Office of the Special Inspector General. He explained that it had two functions. One was a law enforcement function. It was like a mini FBI for the TARP. Guns, badges, special agents, search warrants, kick down doors, rip people out of bed, throw them in jail. Because Congress realized that when you're putting out $700 billion of government honey, it's going to draw a lot of potential criminal flies. Then he explained the other function of this office was an oversight function. Uh, it was going to bring transparency uh, so the American people could see what was going on in this giant bailout and help keep Treasury's eye on the ball with the policy goals intended by Congress. We'd do audits and reports and review what was going on. Now, I have to say, when Mike was telling me all this, I was kind of half listening, half trying to figure out what it, why it was he was telling me. And I started thinking, you know, Mike explained that this job was going to be a presidential appointment, George W. Bush, at the time. And I started thinking, well, Mike's a Republican, a Bush appointee, and you know, it was pretty clear by that point that Senator Obama was going to win the election. I thought, oh, he must be thinking about taking this job, and now he's pitching me to go down with him. So I was, he was talking, I was sort of, you know, planning my, my polite refusal. Uh, and when Mike said to me, ultimately, so what do you think about the job, we did a little who's on first before I realized he was actually asking if I was interested in the job. And I went through my excuses that I had prepared. I had a big trial coming up. I was getting married in Costa Rica in January. Uh, and I just really wasn't that interested in going to Washington. And, and you know, Mike knocked them down sort of one by one. And then I, I rolled out what I thought would be the big gun that would get me off. I said, and Mike, for this George W. Bush appointed position, Mike, you do know that I'm a lifelong Democrat. And I could tell from the way that Mike winced that he definitely did not know. Um, so I went for the kill and I said, and I just donated a couple hundred dollars to the Obama campaign last week. 
Uh, but Mike didn't miss a beat. He said, this is a, a merit position, not a political position. And as I rolled my eyes and thought about the unicorns and fairies that were going to give a high-profile job to Bush appointment to an Obama-contributing Democrat like myself, he, he gave what he later described as his God and country speech. Um, he told me I didn't have a choice. He said it was my duty. He reminded me of the awful days around September 11. Our office is just a couple blocks from the World Trade Center. He reminded me of that awful day and how the prosecutors in our office, and we were really the only office doing terrorism prosecution back then, and because of that expertise, how they sacrificed days, weeks, months, years of their lives serving their country and heading up the investigation of the criminals who did that horrible act. He said this was the economic equivalent of 9-11 and that the American taxpayer had spent a lot of money training me over the years, mortgage fraud and securities fraud, and that it was my duty to step up and take this job. It was a good speech. Um, I told him I'd think about it, and my, my wife gave me sort of the same speech. I, I said, sure, put my name in, not really thinking that, what, that it would happen. Uh, within a week, I had interviewed at the White House and the Treasury Department, two buildings I never imagined I'd even step foot in in my life. Uh, and within six weeks, I was standing in the office of, of of Hank Paulson, then the Treasury Secretary, with my hand on the Paulson Family Bible taking the oath of office uh, as the Special Inspector General. And as I was taking that oath, my focus was really on the first part of the job that Mike had explained, the, uh, the law enforcement function. I mean, that was my background, and look, it seemed pretty cool. I could start my own law enforcement agency just doing high-profile, white-collar accounting fraud. And I thought the other stuff you know, I'll make some recommendations about fraud vulnerabilities and things like that, but, but surely the Treasury Department had it covered when it came with the banks. I realized very soon that I had been extraordinarily naive. Um, it started really within a couple of days when I made what I thought was the not-so-radical recommendation that we have the bank's account and tell us what they're doing with the TARP money, the hundreds of billions of dollars that had been pushed out. I was told that I was stupid, I was told that I was playing politics. I was told when I said, well, maybe I'll just go out and ask them myself, that if I did so, I would destroy the TAR program, and with it, I would destroy the American banking system. When I raised this point to the new Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner, uh, I got cursed out by the cabinet official, Treasury Secretary. So for, I got cursed out for daring to suggest, in his words, that he was anything other than the single most effing transparent secretary of the treasury in this country's effing history, and he didn't use the word eff. <laughs> but it wasn't just transparency. It was, it, was, it was really everything. As I started to look at how they, they shoveled out these hundreds of billions of dollars and getting ready to push out hundreds of billions more, uh, I saw that they had done so with no strings attached, very loose conditions, uh, very few incentives to meet the actual policy goals behind the program. I saw huge fraud vulnerabilities, conflicts of interest. And as I started pointing these things out, I got a very different response from the Treasury officials. This time I wasn't wrong. They acknowledged that, yeah, there were these vulnerabilities, these loopholes, et cetera, uh, but that I didn't need to worry about it. They explained to me with an almost condescending pat on the head that I didn't need to worry about it because these were banks. They would never risk their reputation by putting profit over the public policy goals of these programs. And, and I heard this, 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 you know, this Greenspanian notion that reputational risk uh, would somehow govern and, and overcome any need for fraud regulation, uh, and just thought to myself, where have you guys been? Where have you been the last couple of years where the largest too big to fail institutions, with all due respect to our keynote sponsors, um, <laughs> had demonstrated that they would put profit over just about everything, and in particular, their reputation. And as I looked around the room, I realized where they had been. Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs. Um, and, and I want to be clear, what I realized was this incredible deference that they were having to these institutions, this incredible um, you know, catering and indoling the bailout, the bailout on such generous terms to some of the institutions that were responsible for this crisis, they weren't doing it because they were bad guys, because they were corrupt guys. I mean, these were incredibly patriotic human beings. I mean, these are people who, who left huge salaries and opportunities to come serve their country during a time of financial crisis. Um, but when they came, they didn't leave that ideology behind. 
they brought it with them. And the bailout became more about serving the interests of the largest financial in institutions for which they worked and which they continued to serve than it was uh, for all the other things that it was supposed to do. And I think there's probably no better example of this than in the housing program, the way TARP was running the housing program. And now, just as a little bit of a history lesson, um, and this is the type of history that, that folks don't like to hear about so much in Washington anymore, uh, but the bottom line is that TARP, the bill, doesn't get passed but for a promise to do something about the foreclosure crisis, to do something to help struggling homeowners. Because the administration had a little bit of a problem. Um, if you may remember, the first version of TARP, which was just sort of a straight bailout of the banks, got knocked down, obliterated, had no chance of getting through Congress. And in part, it was because the Republicans in the House weren't on board with the Republican president. They needed the progressive Democrats in the House. They needed those votes to get this bill through. But their problem was that the progressive Democrats were not terribly interested in shoveling hundreds of billions of dollars at the financial institutions, which in their view was wreaking such incredible havoc in their communities, causing these massive foreclosures. So they cut a deal. And the deal was said, OK, Treasury, you can go out and spend $700 billion. And if you might remember, back then, the bailout was supposed to be about buying troubled assets, those mortgages and mortgage-backed securities and CDOs and CDO squared. So they said, OK, when you buy that $700 billion, now you're going to own these mortgages. You need to promise that you're going to modify those mortgages. You're going to make them affordable. You're going to strip out those predatory terms so people can stay in their homes. And Treasury said, sure, OK, we'll do it. Uh, and then, of course, as we know, the ink was not even dry on the bill before Treasury changed its, its approach. Um, and they never bought mortgages or mortgage-backed securities, uh, but instead decided to put direct capital injections by preferred shares uh, of, of, of the banks, particularly the nine uh, largest financial institutions. And with that change in tactics, so went the foreclosure modification program. Now, ultimately, President Obama uh, was, uh, when he petitioned to get the second half of TARP funds, Congress made him commit to launching a modification program. That became the announced $75 billion Home Affordable Modification Program, which was supposed to help fulfilling TARP's original promise, uh, Treasury's original promise, 4 million homeowners stay in their homes through sustained permanent modifications. That's what it was supposed to do. The program, of course, was, was just an abysmal failure. I think to date it's around 850,000 of that promised up to 4 million. Uh, and in many ways, there's, there's been more dropouts, more failures than successes. Uh, in many ways, it harmed more homeowners than it helped. Uh, and it was rushed out. It was basically uh, outsourced to the servicing arms of the largest financial institutions. Um, and it was, it was poorly designed, had some of those conflicts of interest baked in that often made it more profitable to string a borrower out and foreclose and collect fees off the foreclosure than to actually put them into a permanent modification. This in turn incentivized some pretty egregious predatory behavior uh, to get those borrowers into, into foreclosure. We, we read about all the different settlements that have come out as a result of it. Um, and it was really puzzling. And, and frustrating. And I remember when we were pressed the issue, actually it was, it was Elizabeth Warren who was really pressing this issue uh, before she became the now senior senator of Massachusetts. She was uh, the head of a congressional oversight panel, a sister oversight agency. And when she was pressing Geithner, Secretary Geithner, on this issue of how it would work, um, how it was ever going to accomplish these goals, he explained that it really wasn't what we had thought. He said the program would help, in his words, quote unquote, foam the runway for the banks. Like, and in other words, that it was going to extend out the foreclosure crisis because in his words, what he was worried about, there were too many foreclosures over too concentrated a period of time. It would trigger the banks back into insolvency and more bailout dollars and that this was going to protect them. And I realized that this, the one program that was actually supposed to help Main Street, was supposed to help homeowners, the original promise without which there is no TARP had just become another backdoor bailout uh, of, of the banks. And it's because of this failed policy, and indeed the other failed policies and goals of TARP, uh, that I believe that the program was overall uh, a failure. Now, when I, when I say that, I say, hey, the program was a failure, how can you say that? It saved the financial system, didn't it? Well, I think you have to look and see what financial system it is that we actually saved. I mean, we had a financial system in 2008 that was obviously pretty thoroughly broken. It was an, a system dominated by a handful of of, of large financial institutions that policymakers had deemed 
to be so large, so powerful, so interconnected that the normal functions and mechanisms of capitalism wouldn't apply to them. They couldn't fail lest the failure of one bring down the entire uh, financial system and, and, and economy. It was a system that perverted the normal functions of capitalism. And as many of you here who are, you know, from community banks and, and smaller banks and regional banks understand all too well, you know, in a normal capitalist world, if an institution um, in the run-up to the crisis, and I'll just pick on Citigroup because it seems like they were getting bailed out every six minutes uh, during the crisis, but you know, an institution that has you know, massive amount of leverage, meaning they're, they're working with borrowed funds, not their own shareholder funds, um, that is taking huge risks and doing it in a very opaque way through you know, massive uh, exposure to off-balance sheet transactions. In a normal functioning capitalist market, the lenders, the creditors, the counterparties for that institution uh, wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Or if they did, they would extract a premium, a higher interest rate, to compensate them for the very real risk that if this, if this sucker goes down, that they're going to be left holding the bag with, and with an institution that's unable to pay its bills. That pressure, of course, is called market discipline, and that's what makes the institutions in a normal functioning capitalism uh, have get more, raise more capital and be more transparent and take fewer risks. But too big to fail, as we saw in that financial system, turn that on its head. And if anything, the institution is able to extract a premium, pay lower interest rates uh, than its competitors, as its, its creditors, lenders, and counterparties uh, became convinced that they didn't really need to worry about the, the bank failing because Uncle Sam was standing behind it. Uncle Sam has declared them too big to fail and would make good on all of those payments. And not only is this unfair and gives an unfair advantage, but it perverts the, the incentive system. There's no market discipline and it creates incentives, uh, actually even pressure, for the executives of those institutions to pile on more and more risk, to best monetize the too big to fail and the implicit guarantee and that huge subsidy they get and we saw what happened when that risk pooled became correlated and, and exploded. So what do we do with that, that financial system? We doubled down on it. Through TARPON-related programs, we made the largest banks 20 to 25 percent larger than they were going into the crisis. And look, this is not a terribly controversial thing that I'm saying. Uh, this is why we got regulatory reform. It's why Dodd-Frank came in with the promise uh, that never again would we bail out any of the insti largest institutions. Unfortunately, the opportunity we had in Dodd-Frank to really make severe structural change to, to truly end the era of bailouts was an opportunity that we missed. Uh, efforts to do so were beaten back, largely by the Obama administration, the Treasury Department, and Secretary Geithner. Uh, and instead, we had a bill that essentially preserved the status quo. Indeed, some may argue that because of the incredible complexity of the bill and all the requirements it layers on all institutions, not just the largest ones, it gives them an even bigger competitive advantage because they can afford the lawyers and the accountants and, and create loopholes and drive through those loopholes and navigate around the different rules that smaller competitors wouldn't be able to do so. We also did so without any accountability. You know, those who, who are, uh, helped drive our, our economy into crisis uh, were able to keep all of the billions of dollars of bonuses they were able to extract out of their, those institutions uh, before they, they drove a global collapse. Um, jail, you know, usually in financial crisis, we see, we see some executives in, hair, in handcuffs. We saw that uh, in the savings and, after the savings and loan debacle. None. Why? It's a lot of reasons, but one of them was provided by our, our Attorney General, Eric Holder, just a couple weeks ago in testifying in Congress. He explained that the Department of Justice was afraid to charge a handful of institutions uh, lest the indictment itself could bring in that institution down and with it bring down the entire global economy. Too big to fail in, in 2008 has become too big to jail in 2013. Regulators? No, those, the, any accountability there? No, those who drove the deregulatory mania, most of them went through spectacular spins through the revolving door and ended up collecting huge paydays, uh, usually from industries that they themselves were responsible for deregulating turning those government decisions into cold, hard cash in their pockets. Others, architects of the crisis, they got promoted. They became secretary of the treasury, became running the um, economic policy out of the White House. So you'll forgive me if I don't cheer the financial system that we saved and in some way double down, and because all those bad incentives are still in place from 2008 uh, that led to the crisis, and in some ways made even worse, 
It's why I believe we are on a path, a very, very dangerous path towards another financial crisis. On that cheerful note, um, I, I, so I don't want to leave this without some, some suggestions, and maybe we'll get into some more during the Q&A in the panel. Uh, but I think there, there are opportunities here to go back to fix the system, and uh, some of them are, are, are percolating up in, in Washington, uh, some of them are elsewhere. Um, you know, Professor Cooley and, and, and his colleagues at, at, at the Stern Business School um, have their, their own suggestion of, of how to deal with this implicit guarantee, this subsidy, this, this you know, massive um, benefit that the largest institutions get, and which has this distorting effect on capitalism. They, they recommend a tax that sort of the try to measure the systemic risk uh, and, and have the banks pay for the, sort of like uh, paying for their pollution that they're causing on the global economy. And the idea is that they'll then internalize the costs and, and shrink in a matter uh, of their own choosing that'll be most efficient. Um, there was a movement during regulatory reform that would put size caps on the big banks, tying it to GDP, uh, again, then leaving it to the institutions themselves to figure out how to, to shrink to meet those caps. Uh, most recently, you have Br Senators Brown and Vitter have, have proposed a, a new law that really goes at the heart of the matter with incre significantly increased capital requirements for the, for the six financial banks, 15% equity capital uh, requirement, which I, you know, I think would go a long way towards both making them safer so that when they hit the rocks, uh, unlike in our current environment where a 3 or 4% drop in their asset values would wipe them out, uh, you have a nice thick capital cushion so that the shareholders can absorb the losses, not, not taxpayers. And it also has the double benefit of helping to neutralize some of the benefits of being too big to fail. It makes it harder to monetize that. So I like that. Um, and bringing back a form, a modified form of Glass-Steagall, the depression era law that separated commercial banking from the riskier aspects of what our mega banks do today, which worked pretty well uh, and gave us decade upon decade upon decade of financial stability uh, and, and really unprecedented economic growth. And, you know, and there is a growing movement in Washington uh, that makes me think that, that these things are possible. Uh, when you have, you have regulators who are on board, you have members of Congress, you have academics, Sandy Weil, I mean, Dr. Frankenstein himself that created the Citigroup monster has come out publicly uh, recognizing that we need to break up the largest banks. Uh, but, and I just look from the hysteria, uh, it's almost comical from which the banks and the lobbyists are responding to, uh, to the Brown Vitter uh, bill. Uh, makes me think that they're, they're getting a little worried that this might have some traction, even though, frankly, I think you know, the odds of this happening are, are, pretty, are pretty slim. But I think ultimately to solve the problem, we need to do more than just deal with the bank side of the equation. We need to do something about our regulators and the, the regulatory culture that I experience and, and how captured it is to those interests in Wall Street. And, and I'll close with, a, I open my book with this anecdote. Um, and it's a story from April of 2010. And at this point, um, I wasn't getting along so good with my counterpart at Treasury. Um, he was a very nice guy. His name's Herb Allison, and he had a great, great career in Wall Street. He was the president of Merrill Lynch uh, and the CEO of TIA Cref, and he retired, and he very patriotic. He came out of retirement at the request of Hank Paulson to, to run Fannie Mae when it went into conservatorship, uh, and later became President Obama's pick to, to run the TAR program. Um, but we didn't get along well. Our, we, we fought, we argued, our weekly meetings turned into shouting matches. We fought about big things, about transparency and the role of government and, and you know, some, a lot of the issues I'm talking about today. We fought about really little things. One time he was really mad at me because I did a PowerPoint uh, in a like, big government conference and a lot of Treasury people there, I didn't realize, I found out later, um, where I had a, uh, a, a clips from Saturday Night Live when one of the actors is playing Tim Geithner, and they're talking about the stress test. It was pretty funny. It's very funny. Um, <laughs> it really wasn't making fun of Geithner. It was making fun of the banks. Um, but Herb told me that he was upset. He said, and I said, look, Herb, with all respect, I read an article in the paper. Geithner thought he said he himself thought it was funny, so I figured it'd be okay. And he says, well, what did you think he would say? He's not amused, and he's very angry. So I learned that not only does Geithner have a potty mouth, but he also has no sense of humor. Um, <laughs> So anyhow, I thought, okay, let's go, let's get together, let's clear the air. Let's have a drink and try to solve this so we're not yelling at each other all the time. Uh, so we went, we had a, some a terrible restaurant in Washington. We're having a glass of wine, a very nice conversation. I know it was just about three years ago because my daughter just turned three and uh, we were, at the time my wife was expecting. And so we were talking about that. I was very excited. My first child starting a family. We talked about his kids who are, of course, grown. 
And then the conversation turned. And he said to me, you know, what are you, what are you planning on doing next? What's your next step after this job? Because my job by its very nature was a temporary one. And I said, you know, I, I can't really think about that. I can't really let that enter my mind. I've got to focus on my job at hand. And he's like, well, what about you know, something on Wall Street? I said, nah, I really can't think about it. And he said, well, you need to think about it. He goes, because what you're doing in this job, you're doing yourself real harm. And he was talking about my, I had been a pretty outspoken critic at that point of both Wall Street and, and the Obama administration's handling of TARP. And I said, well, I, I really can't think about that. He said, how about something in government? Maybe an appointment, maybe a federal judgeship. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that would be a federal judgeship, that would be pretty awesome for her, but I don't think the Obama administration is gonna be handing one of those out to me anytime soon. And he said, it doesn't have to be that way. All you need to do is change your tone. Be a little bit more upbeat. Be more positive. And these things can happen to you. And I'd say at the time, I was pretty angry. And I called up my deputy, uh, Kevin, who was a former prosecutor with me in Southern District of New York, former international narcotics prosecutor uh, in New York. And I, I laid it out to him. I gave him word for word what happened. And he kind of laughed and he said, you just got the gold or the lead. And I said, you know, I got the reference. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, the boat of the bribe. What he was referring to is, as we had known from our, our, our work, Pablo Escobar, when he was dominating Colombia, he had a particular way of corrupting the government officials he was dealing with, you know, magistrate, a police officer, uh, whoever, a senator. And what he would do is he'd offer him one of two options. He'd say, okay, you could do my bidding, vote for this bill, look the other way, help me with this shipment, and I'll give you this giant bag of pesos, the gold, the bribe. Or you could choose not to, in which case you'll get a bullet in your head. Bullet of the bribe, the gold of the lead. And what Kevin was saying is that I had received the white collar Washington equivalent of, of, of being Escobard, as I said. Um, and at the time, I, I thought Kevin was right, but I realize now that it absolutely was not the case. Uh, Herb was not threatening me, nor was he offering me anything. He was just a guy who had been through Wall Street and been through Washington and understood how it worked. And that's one of the problems that we have to get to the heart of. Our regulatory system punishes those who have, are too harsh. They do themselves real harm. If they stand up to the interests of Wall Street uh, or in government, they are punished for it. Whereas if you go along and get along, and you just wait your time, you too get to spin through the revolving door and claim that giant pot of gold at the end of the Wall Street rainbow or move up within the administration. So ultimately, I believe, in order for us to have that real type of reform, we need to both deal with the corrupting influence of the mega banks on the one hand, but on the other hand, also reform our regulatory structure and the incentives there as well, and incentivize good, aggressive regulation uh, as well. Anyhow, thank you so much for listening. Thank you.